Um, it is my honor to be joined today by John Feiner, President Biden's Deputy National Security Advisor. John, of course, is an Obama administration veteran. He's also, for those who didn't know, a former journalist, so um, always good to talk to him. John, it's good to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, why don't you give us a few minutes of opening remarks, and then we'll dive right in. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be relatively brief, uh, but first of all, I just want to thank uh, both the delegation uh, as well as the Atlantic Council uh, for hosting this year's Defense and, and uh, Future Forum. It's the first time I've been able to participate, but have followed the work for a long time and, and think it's incredibly important and, and certainly valuable to everything our administration is, is trying to accomplish. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that, that everyone in this audience, but broadly uh, across the United States, thinks of the European Union as an incredibly important partner from the United, for the United States. Although I think uh, for most people that follow international affairs, uh, at least until recently, many of them would have said predominantly an economic partner. That is starting to change, not because uh, the economic relations uh, between the EU and the United States are any less important, but because the nature of our defense and security cooperation is so much more consequential uh, than it's ever been before. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I want to underscore is how important we think that is, how strongly uh, we support it and want to uh, cultivate it and, and continue it uh, and extend it going forward. Uh, there were a few things that our administration had to do upon uh, taking office to prepare us for what became, uh, at least in the early days of this administration, the preeminent challenge that we faced uh, together with the European Union, which is obviously Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, first, we had to dig ourselves out of a bit of a hole that was left for us by an administration that seemed to treat our partnerships including very much our partnerships uh, with our core European uh, allies and with the EU as a burden, uh, not something that was a strategic benefit uh, to the United States. And that required just a fundamentally different mindset, uh, again, from this sort of burden mentality to, to, to a partners first, allies first approach uh, to looking at the world that President Biden has championed uh, throughout his career. Second, uh, that required really clearing uh, some of the underbrush in, in the relationship uh, that we had that had built up in recent years. Uh, things like the 232 uh, tariffs and the privacy shield uh, disputes and the Boeing Airbus uh, uh, standoff, all of which uh, we think were resolved uh, favorably for both sides, uh, again, during the course of the first year plus of the administration and really paved the way uh, for deeper and broader cooperation. But third, it really meant recognizing uh, that the European Union was not just an economic partner, uh, but also a very much a security partner. You, you combine all of those steps, uh, and then you, you bring us to the point where uh, this entire proposition of the relationship and, and for what it can do uh, in the world was tested, uh, first and foremost, and it continues to this day, by Russia's unprovoked uh, assault on Ukraine. Now, I think the United States and the EU have responded uh, with remarkable fortitude and resilience and unity in the face of this test in, in at least a few ways. First. The EU uh, and the United States have implemented incredibly strong economic sanctions, sanctions uh, that we both uh, and that we all acknowledge uh, have an impact on our own uh, citizens. Uh, but sanctions that first and foremost have increased uh, the pressure on Russia and, and forced Russia to pay a price for the steps that it's taken. And I think the sanctions have both been stronger, uh, more resilient, and, and also the unity behind them has been greater than I think anybody would have expected. Second, I think we need to acknowledge the EU has stepped up and played a much greater role than many uh, would have expected in the defense aspect of, of the response. Uh, through the Europe, European Peace Facility, the new tool uh, to provide military aid, the EU has now provided 2 billion euros in security assistance uh, to Ukraine, uh, something that I think uh, would have been unthinkable uh, in, an, in an earlier period. Uh, third, the EU and NATO are becoming more aligned. Uh, in recent months, the two organizations have cooperated closely, obviously, on this response, uh, but also on a, on a whole range of, of global issues. I'm happy to talk more about that uh, in, in, in the Q&A, uh, if you'd like. Uh, but the EU has really uh, demonstrated that it's got a global focus, uh, global focus, obviously, to its economic work, also a global focus uh, to its security work uh, as well, and has become a, a critical partner for the United States on, on every major issue that we face around the world. So where do we go from here? Uh, and then I will uh, turn it back to you. So obviously we are expecting and looking to see greater European investments uh, in defense and better capabilities and higher readiness and greater capacity to deploy, deploy nationally, uh, deploy through NATO, 
uh, deployed through the EU. All of this will strengthen our common security and help safeguard our mutual defense. Uh, we welcome the EU's greater geopolitical focus, as I've said, including its efforts to develop the strategic compass and the new uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, which is very much aligned with the approach our administration has taken. Uh, and we continue to, to believe that this relationship is only going to be more important, only going to be more consequential on this core challenge that we currently face uh, in Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, but also in, in any other challenge that arises during the course of, of the coming years, uh, and particularly during the course of this term uh, of the Biden administration. We think we're well positioned, having built a foundation uh, to handle whatever comes down the road. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, John. Uh, I want to breeze through this because we I know you have a hard out at the uh, top of the hour, so we try to cover as much as we can. I'm actually going to ask you my last question first, just based on uh, your opening remarks. Uh, because of the fact that you were uh, you served under the Obama administration, one of the things that has been talked about, especially in the lead up to this conflict, is the lessons that were learned from 2014, from the annexation of Crimea and uh, the destabilization of Donbass in Ukraine. Uh, Former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that a lot of lessons were learned uh, and a lot of things are going to be done differently. And so from your perspective, what lessons were learned from the 2014 experience that has helped the Biden administration address this conflict uh, in a way that, uh, that you believe will sustain some sort of peace or settlement? So I think the most consequential lesson that many of us who went through that experience in, in 2014 learned uh, was essentially to broaden our uh, imagination of what was possible, what Russia was actually capable of, of doing. I think there was uh, probably some belief, at least pre-2014, uh, that a, a, a major uh, a European country being invaded by Russia was something that had been relegated uh, to a time in the past. After going through the 2014 experience, uh, that could no longer be uh, reasonably believed, having seen what Russia had done, having seen, frankly, what Russia had done in, in 2008 uh, in, in Georgia, a, a war that I, I covered back, as you say, when I was a, a journalist. Uh, I will tell you, though, that that was not an easy conversation to have, uh, either internally or uh, at least in the initial stages with some uh, of, our, of our partners around the world. Uh, because, as you know, the United States uh, had a fair degree of, of strategic warning, of intelligence, uh, that showed that Russia may well intend to launch a major invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and then we set about uh, sharing uh, as much information as we possibly could to a, to a virtually unprecedented degree, I think with more countries to a greater extent than, than probably we ever had in our history. And I think because of all the work that we had done in the early days of this administration to kind of clear away some of the misunderstandings and, and disputes, to make clear that we were gonna be an administration that was consultative and it was gonna prioritize uh, these relationships. When we had to have a hard conversation about what might be coming down the road, uh, we weren't uh, just dealing with countries that might be skeptical uh, about U.S. In intelligence, but we were dealing with countries that had seen us uh, sort of walk the walk during the course of a year and knew that on some level we could be trusted uh, and got to a place where we were all operating from a very common factual basis and able to mount a unified uh, response, which has been the key uh, to, to everything that we've done going forward. What about burden sharing? Because one of the things that I've heard repeatedly is this concept of, you know, in 2014, there was this sense that the conflict was in Europe's backyard, so Europe should take the lead on negotiations and things like that. Does Washington feel like it needs to play a more active role today? Is that one of the changes we've seen now? And what kind of role can Washington play that's unique to, say, Europe, which is right there in the backyard of this conflict? So I, look, I think if you're asking me if, if Washington wants our, our partners to continue to step up and, and do more to provide security in, in their region uh, and beyond, to continue to invest uh, in their own defense, in our collective and, and common defense, uh, to continue to increase uh, in this context security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance in response uh, to this conflict, the answer uh, obviously is, is yes. We're asking out of ourselves, we're asking out of our partners and our allies. But I think there has been an extraordinary degree of, uh, of generosity, of uh, significant support in all of those areas uh, that I've just described, uh, uh, starting with the United States and very much including uh, the European Union and its member uh, countries. And, and we're going to have the, the real challenge, though, is not just uh, you know having kind of gotten ahead of this and, and mounted a response in the early days. The real challenge uh, for all of us is going to be sustaining this over time. And I think on some level, Russia is counting on that not being the case, and we're going to have to prove them wrong. 
I don't think anyone questions um, the unified response of EU, the EU and of NATO allies as far as uh, coming to Ukraine's aid with weapons, also with sanctions you talked about in your uh, opening remarks uh, that have definitely uh, weighed heavily on, on Russia's economy. But at the same time, this conflict is at uh, a, an intense simmer in the Donbass. Sever, Sever Donetsk is essentially choked off and at risk of collapse. Uh, President Zelensky this week said that they are at the toughest spot in the conflict. So what more can be done to tip the scale in Ukraine's favor? I mean, again, I, I think you are seeing us uh, almost on a weekly basis, certainly uh, uh, with great regularity, uh, finding ways to provide uh, new forms of support, support that we think will match uh, the moment that we're in, which you uh, just described, I, I think, very well. We have tried at every stage of this contract conflict to tailor the support that we're providing to what the most urgent needs uh, the Ukrainians face have been. In the early days, uh, uh, clearly, that meant providing them uh, anti-air and anti-tank weapons that could blunt a Russian assault that may well uh, otherwise have reached their capital, may have caused Russia to seize uh, enormous swaths of, of the country. But because of uh, the bravery, first and foremost, and, and the fighting skill of the Ukrainian army, but also very much because of the support that the United States and our partners had provided, not just in the run-up to the conflict, but for many years before, they were able to turn the tide. When the conflict, as you say, uh, shifted to the east, so too did the uh, forms of assistance that were provi provided uh, and being provided by us and our partners uh, to respond to this different uh, sort of conflict that's playing out in that part of the country. For a long time, that has meant uh, providing enormous quantities of artillery to match the enormous quantity, quantities of artillery that are being shot at them uh, by the Russians. That has also meant, as, as you know, the provision of uh, multiple launch rocket systems that can uh, give them a bit of extended range, a bit of standoff, a bit of ability to hit uh, with some precision uh, key targets on the battlefield. And I think you will continue to see us provide enhanced forms of assistance. But in, on some level, this is not just new about new and different things uh, that we can provide the Ukrainians. On some level, this is going to be about sustainment. Their ability to sustain uh, the fight and use the tools uh, that they have been provided and that they have been trained on and are being trained on and our ability to sustain our, our support uh, over the long haul. One of the things, I, I just got back from my latest trip to Ukraine two weeks ago and I'm heading back again in two weeks and what I keep on hearing from Ukrainian officials is that there is, they have a sense of hesitation among some of their closest Western allies about the types of weapons systems that are being sent for various reasons, whether or not uh, the heavy weapons fall into the wrong hands or other issues. Now, families disagree, and I think we can agree that families disagree. Can you explain the conversations to the best of your ability within NATO of what weapons should get to Ukraine, how quickly they should get there, and which ones are off the table, and why? So I guess all I would say in response to this uh, is that I think the extraordinary volume and variety of security assistance, including increasingly advanced uh, systems, uh, NATO standard systems, by the way, uh, not just former uh, Russian and, and Soviet systems, and the training that we are providing to use those more advanced systems uh, as effectively as possible does not speak to hesitation on the part certainly of the United States or on the part of our uh, poor allies. Again, our theory of this has been at every point to do our own assessment, uh, obviously informed very much by the assessment the Ukrainians are doing uh, themselves, of what the key needs are on the battlefield and to make sure that we are providing the systems, the munitions that can be most effective for the Ukrainians in having success in whatever they are facing in that period and in that moment, and to be flexible and to adjust and to be nimble enough uh, to, to shift course when the conflict shifts course, as it has now on a number of occasions. And, and so I don't see hesitation in, in that. I see the United States really leaning forward. Uh, just in the last supplemental appropriations, more than $20 billion of it uh, for security assistance. And this is you know, for a country that has ha had a, a roughly $6 billion uh, annual defense budget in, in recent years. That's an enormous amount. It's compounded by the amounts that are being provided by our partners and allies. So I, I guess I just, I don't see hesitation. I see us trying to respond to the, the needs as we assess them. So you're, you're, are you happy, is the Biden administration happy with the pace that NATO allies or other NATO allies are? Would you like to see some of them kind of being more proactive? I, I think what, the, the best way I can uh, respond to that question is when we've had issues, we raise them. We tend to raise them uh, in private, not in public. Overall, we are quite happy with the volume of assistance 
again, not just uh, when it comes to security, but also on humanitarian assistance, also on economic assistance that many of our key partners and allies are providing. When we're not, we will work to get those countries uh, to be pulling their weight and, and doing um, more of their share. Uh, and you know, I don't think we're gonna shy away from that, but I, what I don't think is a useful exercise is, is coming out in public and saying X, Y, and Z country could be doing more. Overall, the response has been formidable. Uh, you know that food insecurity is on a lot of our minds. It is on a lot of your minds as well. Um, as the grain piles up in Ukraine amid uh, the Russian blockade of its ports, can you talk to us a little bit about the White House perspective? What is being done and what are the potential options to maybe either get grain out or alleviate the burden that many countries are going to be facing in the next months and year to come? So I, I think the first thing that's important to do is acknowledge that this is an enormous challenge. It is an enormous challenge, uh, not just uh, obviously in Ukraine or in the immediate vicinity of Ukraine, but it's an enormous challenge globally. And I think the most important comment that I can make in response to any sort of question about food insecurity is that the cause of this insecurity is that one of the world's major food producers, Russia, decided to attack without provocation, without justification, another of the world's major food producers, uh, Ukraine. That initiated a conflict that has made it harder for both countries uh, to, to produce at the levels that they might otherwise uh, produce. Second, Russia, in addition to launching this war, has made it difficult for Ukraine to export by uh, deploying ships into the Black Sea, uh, menacing a potential kind of commercial traffic in, in that part of the world, uh, and virtually shutting down Ukraine's ability to export grain. So that is two steps that Russia has taken that more than anything else, uh, and, and really uh, uh, largely, are responsible for the addition to what was already a significant food security crisis uh, before this war, this war even began. I think letting, uh, uh, letting Russia have a pass on, on that piece of the problem is, is inexcusable, and, and so every conversation about this should start there. Second, we are looking for ways uh, to help Ukraine uh, export more. And frankly, uh, to, to not get in the way of Russia exporting uh, a grain and, and food. Our sanctions uh, do not touch Russian uh, food. Uh, and in fact, we are going out of our way to make clear to commercial providers, to make clear to other countries that they can import Russian grain without any risk uh, of running afoul of our sanctions. But the Ukraine export problem is, is, a, is a challenging one. Uh, there really are only three ways of getting uh, grain out of Ukraine in significant quantities. Uh, they can go by land, by rail uh, to the west, I and mean, there are a number of, of rail lines and, and ports the other end of those lines through which they can export. That can get some percentage of Ukraine's grain uh, to market. Is that they realistic? Go, uh, Is that a realistic option? Sorry to, to interrupt. It, it's, it's the only realistic option right now because it's the only option that's functioning. So there is you know, something on the order of a million and a half metric tons a month of grain. Uh, going out through these western routes uh, from Ukraine. That is it. And, and, you know, this is a country that could be exporting five, six million metric tons a month. So you get a sense of what a percentage is lacking. The other option would be to go north uh, through Belarus. Obviously, that relationship is highly problematic and complicated, including by the fact that Russia has deployed troops uh, to Belarus. So no Ukrainian grain is, is moving north. The other option, and the best option in, in almost every way, would be if Ukraine could use its pr predominant port the port of Odessa, through which it could meet almost its entire export uh, quantities and, and volume uh, and export by, by sea, through the Black Sea from Odessa. The challenge there is that the Russian uh, Black Sea fleet has effectively blockaded that port, has prevented Ukraine from being able to get its grain to market. The UN is working on this problem. The United States is very much uh, working on this problem uh, to try to get Russia to back off of its blockade, to enable commercial shipments, and not to take advantage of the fact that commercial shipments you know, could eventually be allowed to uh, use that opportunity to menace Ukraine's uh, ports in the way they already have in the early days of this conflict. That is the diplomatic challenge we face. The stakes are very high, uh, again, not just uh, for Ukraine, but for the rest of the world, given the global food insecurity crisis, and, and we are working it very hard. John, I have about 30 more questions for you, but unfortunately, I want to be mindful of your time. That's all the time we have. So the lightning round is over, but thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Very important uh, discussions and lots more to come. Thank you so much. Thank you.